So we are reading together Anarchy, Geography, Modernity, selected writings of Elise Reclu, <laughs> to pronounce it, with yeah. one of the editor translators, John Clark. And um, today we are reading chapter, discussing chapters four, a philosophy of progress, and five, anarchism and social transformation. Welcome. I know, David, you wanted to say something about your thoughts oh. on it. Well, John, I just wanted to compliment you on it. It's, it's so well. I like how you present everything very well, including his shortcomings. And uh, yeah. which it, it's very thorough, and, <laughs> and, it, and it's really interesting. It's really like, yeah, I see why why you like him a lot. He he's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, he was an amazing figure and uh, someone who deserved more attention in the English speaking world. You know, he's always been better known in the Mediterranean world and therefore in Latin America. Uh, where his ideas had a lot of influence. Well, particularly, I guess he was even better known in the era in which uh, he lived and then had an influence on revolutionary movements. Uh, because, you know, the, the, the uh, well, the Spanish anarchists uh, recognized him and he, he influenced the Spanish anarchist culture, really, because he was much more than just a political thinker. Uh, he, he had so much to say about culture and values and everyday life. Uh, so so he, he affected uh, movements on various levels. I and mean, we, can, we can talk about that. that uh, the, the critique of, it's the, we're, not, we're not to the critique of domination yet, are we? But uh, it comes out there, but it, it comes out in the, in the social transformation chapter also. Uh, he, he was extraordinary in confronting so many forms of domination and so many areas of life. So I don't want to say too much right now. I'd like to see what people are interested in, and then we can talk about that. Well, another thing, since nobody jumped in, I, mean, <laughs> I admired so much <laughs> that he really tried to live a life in accord with his commitments, his values, his beliefs. He had great humility. Uh, he, he really undertook an extraordinary uh, project, you know, several uh, amazing projects, one of which was the, the new universal geography, which was, uh, I, well, it depends on the edition, but something like 18,000 pages, you know, of covering. It was, <laughs> Some people say he was the last person uh, in history to try to undertake a universal geography, not of course by himself, but it was really his project, but he had collaborators and teams of people who were working with him. But it really was his project. It was not uh, a committee you know, that, that put it together. And then also his um, Six volume work, uh, L'Homme la Terre, Humanity and the Earth, was an amazing undertaking, uh, which, in a, in a sense, was a founding work of social geography, but it was also kind of um, uh, uh, an amazing work and, and one, of, one of the key works in, in the history of people who have tried to kind of do the Earth story, you know, the story of the Earth and humanity within it. Uh, and then, of course, he was he 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 was a revolutionary and political activist, and was extremely active in the First International and in various uh, um, political groups, particularly those in alliance with Bakunin in, in that period. Um, so, so that was another dimension. And the, but then also just the dimension of everyday life, his family life. Um, uh, he unfortunately uh, lost uh, two wives. He was married three times. His first two wives died uh, in one case uh, very, very soon after their marriage. But he had an extraordinary relationship with his uh, brothers and sisters, uh, his 
wives, his children, uh, and a kind of extended uh, family and community uh, in which he you know, practiced uh, his cooperative communitarian kind of values in everyday life. I mean, that's only a, just a, a little beginning of, of uh, what, he, what he achieved. Yeah, that makes me think of, you talked about how he, uh, oh, what was it? How, how creating little cells of uh, just a, a sort of their personal sphere where it's a transformative process on that small level that can grow to the bigger. Right, right. He said little republics, uh, small loving associations, you know, he described it in various ways. And of course, it ties in with the idea of the affinity group or the primary community, which is one of the things I really wanted to stress, uh, if people are interested in, in that. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, what we could call the, the communal imaginary that existed during his life and how it address the various levels of, um, of social relationships, you know, the, the personal, the, the larger local community, uh, the, 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 the universal community or the earth community, all of those levels uh, uh, were, were addressed by part of his vision of social organization and social transformation. Well, before we get to that, I have a question. How does he get to the year 13,300, whatever, based on that first eclipse? I don't understand how he's working out the years. You know, that's a really interesting question. I never have found out either. <laughs> I never have found out how he could have... Uh, you know, it's very interesting. And uh, I, I, you know, there's an article uh, about, I, I, there is one article about this suppression of, it's, you know, it's in French, but uh, the, the, the suppression of, of the traditional calendar and the proposal of a universal calendar. Um, I mean, obviously that would be in prehistory. So he would have to have looked at some kind of traditions that were passed down of uh, some important uh, eclipse, I, but I, I I don't know how that could be pinned down. I'm it sorry. Must be either he's looking at eclipses, like the number of eclipses since then, or eclipses, and then to me it makes sense. From there, you just go with solstices or something, right? Something that's observable. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how you get to thirteen thousand. No, I have no idea. I think I, it seemed like it was straightforward that he had some, you know, maybe the uh, Assyrians or something, some some recorded eclipse, and then he's just yeah. doing regular years. The problem there. is it's so far back that, but but uh, you know, I, it would have to be something that came from some kind of legend that somehow would make sense uh, in relation to geo history. But I, you know, I really didn't think the number was the important thing about it, but the idea that we could. We could, uh, you know, I probably should have, but unfortunately I've read a lot of Reclu and about Reclu and I've just never seen any explanation really of how annoying. you can come up with because that. So I don't, I don't know what time, to say. Time is very important to me, like the philosophy of time and all that. And so David, I looked it up, you know, like the first recorded eclipse and that would only bring us to like 5,000 years, <laughs> not 13. Well, that, that makes a lot more sense, you know. I, I, uh, but uh, how do we get to 13,000 years? Like, I don't know how long is a year. Basically. This is a lot, a, a lot more interest to you than it is to me. <laughs> because to me, when I, when I read that, you know, the significance was that he wanted to pick something that related human beings to the earth, to the moon, to the sun, to the cosmos, to the to geo history, to the passage of time, and and to me, it's if we can only figure it out uh, back to five thousand years ago, I'll go with it. If people want to use that, 
Yeah, uh, that's because, yeah, I agree with them. So I want to say, okay, let's start this year is what? But I don't know how to go from his year, 13,000. But we don't have to. He, he yeah. never, you know, he never wanted to impose, or he wanted people to figure this out for themselves. Maybe he wanted them to talk about it a lot, like how could you possibly come up with such a distant date? I don't know. Yeah. I'd love, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to start looking at uh, texts again, but uh, you know, I, I really, I, I, I didn't really want to spend a lot of time on figuring out which year it was, but I really wanted to focus on the on the concept of looking at the cosmos, the universe, the you know, uh, and 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 relating us to all of that, and uh, also just thinking about. Uh, uh, the fact that human beings for thousands of years have been intrigued by something like an eclipse, a solar eclipse, and that it's it's a momentous thing to human beings. Uh, so, I mean, that to me, the imaginary part of it is important, not the mathematics of it so much. And I, I just, honestly, I just can't imagine how you could pin it down that way. Well, I'll just throw in about eclipses that um, they are powerful, and, and it's a it's a it's a mind altering experience. And Andrew Weil, and in, in, he had a whole chapter about eclipses in his book, uh, The Marriage of the Sun and the Moon. And it's something that, interestingly, governments suppress. It's like, you know, there was the whole scare about like, oh, you'll go blind and back in the 50s it was they were literally in 60s they were literally uh like kids were made to stay indoors and it's like and they said the best way to view the eclipse is on television <laughs> because of all the scare and it's like it's an insane scare it's like worried that oh yeah if you look at the sun while well, it's only partially eclipsed you know you could hurt your eyes but it's it's pretty obvious mm -hmm. well and, and it's not like uh and when it's fully eclipsed it's completely safe so so they used to like, have, you know, there was in his in his book he talks about the, uh, you know, they would make kids like, you know, close the curtains in the schoolroom and every, all the kids have to like, you know, well watch it on TV or whatever. It just it was crazy. <laughs> but just the point about the eclipses, they are they are something that's beyond our, I guess, in the imaginary that they're just so powerful. Yeah, the thing I remember about. Um... The, the major eclipse that I observed was um, the shadows of leaves of bushes and trees that there, there was there was there was the shadows were just so weird. You know, I'd never seen a, it, it, it. I'm sure that uh, when when this happened, particularly in places where there were not stories about the eclipses and it happened. Uh, kind of out of nowhere, this must have really amazed people so much. But I, you know, I'm, I just looked up since we, it seems like this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, it is like, only, uh, like more like 55, uh, hundred years ago that there's, you know, it seems, seems to be some consensus. Uh, but, but, uh, I'd be willing to look into it further. <laughs> I wish I hadn't mentioned the date that he came up with <laughs> and just uh, said that he suggested that we should use the first recorded eclipse because I really didn't want that to become the important thing. But I, you know, I am very, uh, interested now um, well to, to why don't we just uh, cancel this discussion and we can all do some research on uh, on on the earliest eclipses and uh, theories about them I wonder I mean I, I really want to look into that now <laughs> Interesting. You, I, I, it, my opinion attitude is more like yours originally was. It's like it's pretty cool, but I'm more interested in uh, the other things he's got. You've got to say here in this book. 
<laughs> so, and I mean, as I suggested in the, we could really go through page by page. There's so much stuff here, but maybe I'll just start with, um, well, I didn't need to read it, but I'm just looking at what I've highlighted and, uh, yeah. There's the stuff about the, the prophets on page 41. Okay. Well, he starts about talking about the uh, Hebrews were like, had this moral revolution with, with various prophets that were saying, you know, the subjugation is bad, domination is bad, and we need to change that. But, right. But then in the second paragraph there on 41, while the prophet's message of justice can constitute an, an enormous contribution to the history of liberation, it was also inextricably enmeshed in the system of historical domination. Then the mm -hmm. fact how that that counter message was actually absorbed by the by the um, by the, the I don't know what it was by the uh, religious authorities to you know right right the pursuit of knowing the only God the absolute master. So the prophetic tradition also contributed to the creation of the theocratic state and the first perfect religious intolerance in history. That's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that in Reclu. And uh, it's one thing I admire about him, you know, since I went through this long work, L'Homme de la Terre, which covers all of human history and even geohistory before humans. And one of the things he stresses is um, the revolutionary nature of a lot of uh, religious movements and developments within world religions. Uh, so, you know, we have to recognize that the Hebrew prophets, I mean, it's, you know, it's an exaggeration, but the Hebrew prophets kind of invented social justice, you know, and uh, particularly uh, if you're familiar with the book of Amos, uh, it's, it's really like a revolutionary track. Uh, and uh, Reclu discusses in different cultures how you know revolutionary messages emerged within religious traditions and then they were absorbed in, into the dominant system, uh, you know, the system of domination. He mentions that the same thing happened with Buddhism yeah. uh, and that, that the original message of Buddhism, not just like the prophets in Judaism and Christianity, but the, the really core message of Buddhism is very revolutionary, but that very quickly, it, it, you know, particularly he mentions that it was turned into a state religion under Ashoka uh, and, and that uh, there's this constant tendency to absorb and uh, uh, ideologically distort the messages of the great traditions. But he took those very seriously. In that sense, he was different uh, uh, from a lot of uh, classic European radical, revolutionary, or leftist theorists who just had this kind of blindness to religion. It was just their enemy. And they, they really couldn't see these. And of course, part, there's a very concrete reason why you could understand this. It was that he came out of a dissonant religious tradition, which was more or less um, uh, the the you know in in the British tradition there's the idea of dissent. Well, he was um, he was brought up among the dissenters from dissent. You know, he his father was a minister in uh, a Calvinist sect that was uh, like more dissenting than the Calvinists were from, from the stand. Of course, you know, growing up in Southern France, uh, there's a long history of uh, the, you know, so-called Albigensians, oh, yes. the Qatar, the, the, the uh, Gnostics, also the Protestants, uh, you know, there was a different kind of, uh, it's quite, it's quite different to be part of a Protestant tradition in an area in which there were crusades, religious crusades against, well, particularly the, the Gnostics, but also to, 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 to conquer the South. And, uh, you know, you, so, so the whole development of the state uh, and uh, centralized power and so forth was tied in with the, with the, with the crushing of religious dissent. And, and really, I mean, you know, the, the, among the, the, uh, the Gnostics, there were very, very uh, 
radical anarchistic developments within those traditions. So, uh, you know, he said that, you know, uh, he, he was, he was uh, an anarchist communist and he said he learned communism within his family, that, that that's what they practiced, that's what they believed in as part of their religious tradition. So he was quite familiar uh, with how that can operate, but also how powerful it was to grow up in a tradition that's so much at odds with the dominant system of, domi you know, the system of domination, competition, a hierarchy, elitism, and, and so forth. He knew that from, from personal practice. I think that's one reason why he stressed so much these small loving associations, you know, really affinity groups or, you know, like a base community in some sense. And um, he, he, he was involved in, in um, the cooperative movement and intentional communities and so forth at one point. Uh, he ended up with very mixed feelings about them, uh, about these these forms of organization, because uh, he found that they so often became marginalized, and uh, and that people became obsessed with their little project and lost the connection to a larger movement for social transformation. Um, but he and his brother Eli actually. Uh, co-edited a cooperativist uh, journal at one point uh, earlier in their life before they got involved in the international workers movement so much. Um, and and I, I think the, the spirit of that was was preserved. I mean, there's this concept that that he writes about, which he, he of course, you know, he studied all the traditions and uh, he, he admired a lot of the communal traditions in Switzerland, for instance. And, he, and I, I love this phrase that he uses, the spirit of full association was there, that it pervaded every aspect of life. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of connections there, personal, uh, familial, uh, communal, traditional, you know, that, that, that opened him up to things that a lot of other people didn't, didn't catch on to, particularly most of the major revolutionary uh, theorists of his time. Um, let's see, maybe I'll just read Lewis's comment. Okay. John, he, he recalls your, um, oh, I've lost it on my screen. But recollecting your uh, in the '80s and '90s response to your uh, your writings on Buddhism and Taoism. Okay. Fifth estate. Yeah, the fifth estate, right? Okay. In the late '80s and early '90s. Yeah, and you know, I have a general idea of what I was doing in the late early in the late '80s and early '90s. I, you know. Uh, I, I did. Uh, I did a couple of things for the Fifth Estate, and of course, I've done things under two is two different personae. And uh, Fifth Estate was one of the places that was publishing some of the stuff that I was doing. Uh, in the, you know, I kind of think, I don't think I really am any one person. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, people have told me, oh, you had a pseudonym. Well, I didn't really have a pseudonym. I was just doing something in a certain mode at, at a certain time. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, I really feel, I mean, in some ways, I feel much more alienated from the John Clark persona than I do from the Max Gaffard persona. Um, there's a lot more to be alienated against. <laughs> or from, I mean, I, I say against, I don't know, maybe that's going too far, but alienated from, but I really do feel like alienated against in some ways. But I mean, you know, one of the things that's part of uh, personal development or development of a project that could be called a person is to uh, see contradictions and uh, watch the contradictions work out. Uh, I guess that's goes in as part of the territory when you're having a dialectical uh, and just being aware of the, the actual dialectical nature of our reality. Right. I mean, the, the dialectical nature is always there, but the awareness isn't. Right. So that's that's what he keeps. He does keep holding us to that. Which I, yeah. And I mean, you know, to, to me, it's a very important thing 
uh, that I've thought about, I really, I mean, I write, need to work on it more in writing about it because uh, that's when you really find out what's happening. And um, it's, I might call it um, awareness of moments of contradiction. For instance, the moment where you're saying something you've said a thousand times and you become a little bit of aware of the fact that you don't really believe it or that. Or <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, what do you do at that point? Like, forget it, forget this awareness or um, correct yourself, uh, have certain defense mechanisms that stop that from developing, or do you pursue that and see where it goes? I mean, to me, that's one of the most crucial things in life. And in a certain sense, it's the negation of the negation at work. Um, I mean, you could say it in two senses. There could be a negation of the negation that's a suppression of the negation, but a real negation of the negation is to move to another level of negation where you're not just going to experience the negation affectively, but you're gonna think it through and see where it goes. Whoops. I think uh, this, okay. I'll, I'll just, I just wanted to read one just more. negated thing. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On page 42, I mean, it's kind of sums up the, the religions <laughs> negating themselves. It's like such, he remarks that such is the fate of religions. In becoming established, they negate their own starting points, systematize their betrayal, and repudiate their own founders. That's pretty strong. And, and, yeah. And I, I, uh, you know, he shows the irony of some of this, like with the yeah. Jane. Uh, the Jane, right. That was right. This is right after the Jane. in some ways. Uh, but, but this could be adapted to the class system. And, and, you know, that's one of the problems with some of these kind of radical religious groups that they develop so much in some ways. Um, being different you know, is a big advantage in many ways, you know, awareness of your difference. And of course, you also then get, get this feeling of being special and having something of particular value that you want to pr propagate and develop. Um, so often, uh, you know, so in some ways, the Protestants in the South of France, like if you, you know, grow up in a Southern Baptist culture in Alabama, you're not going to feel that way. You're going to be complacent and so forth, except if you're a kid who grows up in it and realizes immediately how oh. insane it is, you know, and you, you you go, you know, you probably move to a big city or something like that. But, um, but if you grow up in one of these dissident cultures, um, and of course the Jains were one, you know, some of the Protestant groups in Southern France, and um, you, you could think of many other examples. Um, Often uh, this leads to, for instance, maybe very being very good at uh, being entrepreneurial, for instance. You know, you're not part of the masses. You kind of have a distant relationship to the masses and maybe you can, you know, how to manipulate the masses, take advantage of opportunities, you know. So, so there, are the, there are these contradictions so that the, you know, the Jains uh, were, were, were noted for you know ahimsa you know the ultimate of of not doing harm but he says in the set in, in the end they can become part of a system in in which they'll do a lot of harm and be able to think that it's not really their fault because it's part of that system out there it's not part of their jain practice something like that uh, so, so you know, the, 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 he's, he's writing about the, the, the need for a critical consciousness and also to link things together. Really? But so then from religion, he moves on to science, or in, in this chapter, we get on to science, which the new religion. Yeah. This culture, which, um, yeah. And he's, as you point out, he's he's kind of taken with it, but at the same time, he 
he does have some awareness that okay sometimes it's it's been overused or it's been you know like technology has been used to squash some uh you know some of the, the things that we like in the world well he certainly believes that i mean he was he was an early critic of uh technological development and he writes about you know particularly i remember i think it's in in his, his pamphlet uh to my brother the peasant i think uh that that pamphlet where he he talks about the mechanization of agriculture and uh, he was he was very disturbed by what he saw happening in the Midwest of the United States in the late 19th century where where agriculture was going in basically going in the direction of industrialized agriculture agribusiness and he, you know he was very disturbed about where that was leading which was the dust bowl <laughs> well eventually well, dust bowl was one effect of course the other the big effect was yeah well, you know, he thought it was having an effect on human beings, this mechanization. It was it was having an ecological effect. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he was very sensitive to that. He also was very disturbed. He spent a lot of time, you know, in North America. Um, he spent uh, several years in Louisiana and uh, he took a I, I really wanted to translate this and never got around to it. But he, he took a trip up the Mississippi. Uh, and and uh, wrote about that, and uh, you know he did know a lot about uh, North American geography. Obviously, he also did a huge amount of research in order to do his universal geography, and he was very disturbed about the destruction of the ancient forests. You know, at a very early uh, point in history. So there were a lot of things that that went together in his analysis. And certainly it was technological, it was ecological. I mean, just to, to summarize where this is going and it, uh, the critique of, of domination chapter really tries to put it together. Uh, you know, he had this anarchist critique of the state. Uh, he had uh, also an anarchist communist critique of capitalism. Uh, he had a radical feminist critique of patriarchy, and uh, really was a precursor, I think, of ecofeminism. Um, he had a tremendous admiration for indigenous societies and, uh, you know, the communal traditions that had been largely destroyed or forgotten. Um, he was a, an important figure in the movement for vegetarianism and uh, humane treatment of animals. That was a very, very big concern for him. Um, what have I overlooked? I mean, those are, those are the critique of technology was part of it. Um, I, I think even beyond being an ecological uh, figure, um, I think the I, this idea of the 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 Earth story, you know, I I, I, uh, I knew Thomas Barry, who used to come to Loyola every year for many years, uh, who who wrote co-authored the Universe story, and he had this idea that we need a new sacred story for our age, and it's it's not you know none of the old stories, including the you know the nineteenth century secular scientific. Uh, myth of progress and science being part of that. None of those work anymore. Uh, not that they ever exactly worked in the past either. But but uh, we need we need to look at the universe story and the Earth story within it as as the the emergence of value, the emergence of goodness, the the emergence of flourishing of many life forms on Earth and so forth. And I I think in many ways. Uh, you know, uh, Reclus was a precursor of that, uh, that idea of, of, of placing ourselves in geo history would be one way of looking at it or the earth story or, you know, one of the big questions is um, this question of, um, you know, it's called grand récit in French, the, the, the uh, grand narratives is how it's usually translated into English, um, strangely in some ways, because it really just means big, you know, grand, okay. Um, so, so, uh, the idea is we need these stories. We need to, to look at our, I mean, part of the reason why we need them is because we are, we really are part of that. <laughs> and, and we can often 
not find a way of thinking our, of ourselves as part of that. Uh, so I think Reclus contributed a lot to the effort to rethink our our stories, our narratives, our myths, uh, and 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 to uh, to think about how they could be ecological and earth centered and uh, life centered and part of human flourishing on this planet rather than human destruction of the biosphere. So I think he's a really crucial figure in that sense, starting this project in the middle of the 19th century. Wow, yes, that, that's a nice summing. Um, one thing that I'll point out is, well, you say it's like the, the, um, the unit, Unity and diversity, the, the, the nicely put in this one page, on page four, the bottom of page 46. Yeah. And I'll just read. Yet spontaneity and choice remain possible, and they constitute the basis for creating a future society in which non dominating in unity and diversity is finally realized. Free society establishes itself through the liberty provided for the full development of each human person, the original basic cell of society who then joins together and associates he, as he wishes with other cells of a changing humanity. Yeah, commitment to communal individuality. Mm. Yeah. Alan Ritter sees it's the strength of the anarchist thought. It's mm -hmm. um, that, that whole idea of um, like the, the one and the many. I mean, it's such a big, You know, it, it's it's something that things keep coming back to in my mind anyway. Okay. Yeah. I actually didn't mark that passage. Let me, because uh, I, I think we need to think about it a lot. Um, I, you know, I, a lot of this I'm not writing about just because we we have to agree with Riku entirely. I think I think you know I admire him tremendously. Um, but there, there's an interesting question here. Um, and I, I'd like to look at the original uh, passage, but I think, yeah, you know, I think our translation is usually pretty good. But it's always good to you know yeah. look over look over the original text. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, just point out that I actually meant to read the the passage from the paragraph above that. Oh, yeah. really? Reclus, the, the end of that second paragraph on 46, Reclus' okay. social thought is instructive as an example of a critical holism that gives full recognition to the relative autonomy and integrity of individuals. It is thus, like any truly dialectical social ecology, a theory of unity and diversity. The right. nature of social project, progress cannot be understood merely through an analysis of the development of structures, institutions, or other social roles but also requires careful attention to individuality and subjectivity. Yeah, right. that's actually the one that I was really- Yeah, I mean, that, that uh, yeah, I wrote a lot of this a long time ago. So my, my problem now would be, I'd probably make it twice as long to really talk about some of the issues that come up in some of these passages. Uh, so maybe I would mention that the nature of social progress or even understanding the nature of social determination, as I talk about it sometimes, cannot be understood merely through an analysis of the development of structures, institutions, or other social wholes. Um, but we have to understand those structures and institutions and not de-emphasize the structural and institutional nature of things. You know, I've tried later on to talk about these different spheres of social determination, and one is the institutional, and they're overlapping. So, I mean, you know, institutional is not separate from ideological. Institutions have ideologies. It's not separate from the imaginary because there's an institutional imaginary and so forth, and the imaginary is about institutions. Um, you know, I think we really have to think a lot about how that works. The ethos, of course, and then and the uh, social materiality, all of those are really important. 
Uh, at the same time, things are happening on the subjective level. There are subjects. And um, the only, another thing that I might change if I were doing this now, uh, I, I, in the nineties, I thought about using the term holism and I tended to like throw it out after a while and not even talk about holism because um, the problem with holism is that it, it, it leads people to think that there are some things, some things that are just holes. And, you know, I've mentioned at times that the concept of the whole on could be helpful to look at something as a whole in relation to some things apart in relation to other things. And also the idea of, you know, um, negation is determination that something not only is what it is, but it always is what it is not. You know, its nature is determined by what it is not from a certain point of view. So, you know, I would say a lot of what I wrote here is not adequately, it doesn't harp on the dialectical nature of things as much as I would like to, you know, uh, uh, to try to help because people keep forgetting these things. And if you don't constantly go over that, people fall into a more objectifying, uh, totalizing kind of view of things. And I would be, I would worry about that much more than when I, when I wrote this. I mean, I was still under certain bad influences at that time that I was reacting against and not really adequately um, sublating. Ben, 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 do you want to jump in here? You were unstuck. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry to interrupt the flow, um, but I guess it might be in the flow. Anyway, uh, I guess to pick up on the thread of the grand narrative, uh, and how it might be realized in a way that honors uh, unity and or multiplicity and unity, unity and multiplicity. Um, one of the things that really struck me from the third chapter was bioregionalism, which is an idea that is kind of new to me. Uh, you know, I grew up kind of absorbing uh, a maybe commodity view of space. You know, I thought it was kind of interesting that folks seized on the time element that was certainly interesting to me when I did the reading too but then there's also at least I'm interpreting bioregionalism as having to do with space or place and thinking about um you know like where I'm living now is the longest I've ever lived anywhere I know where the sun is going to be at certain times of the year uh it's it's a cool thing it's a different thing and if I go to say a museum and I see cosmological diagrams of various societies a lot of times they might seem abstract but then they're mapped to specific features of the physical environment and so part of what i'm thinking now in the context of this discussion in this reading is a just learning more about bioregionalism and how it may overlap with or differ from terroir or is bioregionalism historically kind of a french idea or thing or why might that be and then also a grand narrative, yes, but then a, a grand narrative that might allow for or prompt um, some recognition of these, just the, the, the wealth of bio regions. Is that the appropriate terminology? I don't know, but uh, that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from too. Hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of good questions there. If I could just finish one thing on the last subject and then I wrote a lot of notes on what you just said. But uh, on on page one on page forty six, just to I mean I, I really uh, one of the things I that I'd like to do if I if I'm supposed to talk about this book is to a certain extent be more critical of Reclus than I was, and secondly be critical of myself when I was writing it, and uh, therefore you know I, I think it could be helpful to make just one one more point on that page. Um, I think I would have more to say about calling each human person the original basic cell of society. Um, first, this is reclus, to talk about it as original, because there is no origin, there's a continuity in which things develop, tr become transformed, uh, make uh, jumps, uh, uh, 
you know, in development and so forth. So I think we need to look at that part. And uh, and also, I mean, I think he really, I don't remember where footnote 45 refers to, uh, what, what text this was in. Um, does anybody know? Um, what's this chapter, uh, Philosophy of Progress? Um, let me let me just look. Um, I, I'm just curious what you know because the different works are are on different uh, theoretical levels. Forty five. It comes from Lume de la Terre, which usually is is a more sophisticated uh, work than a lot. You know, some of his more popularized writings, um, but. You know, you really have to be careful about this analysis of human beings being a certain way and then joining together and associating. Now, you know, again, you have to look at what he means here and you can interpret it in various ways. You can look at it as a kind of account of how human society develops or I guess the most uh, charitable interpretation is that eventually human beings develop the ability to join together and associate as they wish. Um, uh, but but there, there, there are problems in that statement. It, I think it could easily confuse the issue. So I, I uh, uh, sometimes I just kind of say generally positive things about what he's saying, but I, I, I think you have to look at the complexity of these issues. And um, I just wanted to throw that out to keep those issues in mind. Uh, but on bioregionalism, um, there's a lot to say. And uh, what, what you were saying about uh, becoming aware of things is very important. And bioregionalism, I know, I, I'm not sure if, if we can come up with an exact uh, lineage of where bioregional thought came from, but it, it seemed to emerge more in the United States. Uh, there, there's a very good book uh, on uh, bioregionalism in France. And I can't remember the name offhand, but I, I think I reviewed it for a publisher once. And um, uh, in any case, there, there, there is a lot of bioregional consciousness in a country that has rural traditions like like uh, uh, France. And it's pointed out, people that write about bioregionalism in France uh, point out, for instance, that sometimes people talk about mon pays, my country, and they mean like the countryside that they live in, that's my country. Uh, you know, the French Republic is called um, uh, la patrie, you know, which is an interesting word because patrie sounds kind of patriarchal, but it's feminine. <laughs> it's not patrie. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the Marseillaise starts with uh, uh, les enfants de la patrie. You know, it's so important. We are the children of the mother country in a way, the mother father country, I guess we might, if, if we really want to preserve the, 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 the complexity of the whole concept. But, but the, uh, Le pays can be the real land, the real countryside, my country that I associate, you know, that I identify with, where I live, the place that I know. And, uh, you know, this idea that you mentioned of uh, space, and then after that, you said place, which was interesting that you went from space to place, because, uh, you know, in a certain sense, um, you go in different directions if you think about things being in space or if you think of, uh, of things being in a place. And bioregionalism is very much um, thinking about place and where you are and where you live. Um, you know, one of the concepts in bioregionalism is inhabitation and re-inhabitation and, and uh, cultures that inhabited their place, that they, what, what was important is not that they were located somewhere in space, but they were living in some place. And, and uh, you know, that sometimes we talk about some cultures being more cultures of nature uh, and in which 
obviously every culture is a culture of nature and you know everything is nature by the way <laughs> so so that even if we talk about being alienated from nature it's nature alienated from nature it's something that goes on naturally in nature uh, so so we have to you know think about how we're using these con concepts and think about them critically in other words we off we almost always whenever we say anything we have to say it with reservations I mean, that's part of dialectical thinking also, that every time I say something, I'm saying it with reservations, like I would be an example of that. <laughs> who is that I? You know, who is that I who's speaking? Who, where is the I that isn't speaking? What's the relationship between those two I's? You know, when, when, I, when I say something and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, but I really would need an hour to really talk about what I'm saying in 10 seconds because there's so many complexities. In a certain sense, there's a contention of, you know, the, the, the uh, speaking eye and the critical eye that's watching the eye that's speaking at that time and saying, what a fool you are. You think you can actually say that? How can you possibly say that? Which is why, you know, the Tao Te Ching is really uh, wonderful because the beginning of this, this great work, one of the great classics of Chinese uh, philosophy says, um, you know, it's, this is, it's translated with the word eternal, but it kind of means the ultimate, uh, you know, the Tao that can be Taoed is not the eternal Tao. Uh, the way that can be weighed is what it's really saying, but also the word that can be spoken is not the eternal word. Like we always think, in a sense, this is where RK comes in that we somehow uh, attribute an ultimacy to something that is not ultimate. I mean, the ultimate is all, all, ultimately, the ultimate is the relationship. Between, you know, that's why in, in, uh, in Chinese philosophy, you have this idea of primordial chaos, that if you're gonna go back to origins, you're not gonna find a defined origin. You know, there's this figure, there's this myth about what happened to this primordial chaos figure and uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, this, this mythological figure was killed by trying to interfere with it and not let it be what it was and also what it was not. Uh, so so uh, we have to look at all this with these reservations. But back to bioregionalism, um, uh, it, it, there's, there's a certain idea about space that's you know space for us has to be in some sense cartesian space because the culture has gone in that direction with the scientific revolution modernity also all of the other developments of capitalism of measurement of quantification of all of that so that uh, there's an ideology of space that makes it you know cartesian and capitalist and statist and bureaucratic and and ultimately about boundaries and, and measuring and quantifying and buying and selling and all the other things that are part of that heritage. While place in some ways challenges all of that, you know, to be in a place, uh, it, it, it almost perplexes us because we're so space oriented in many ways, you know, uh, that, that, that we really have to think about place and what it means. And in, in bioregional thought, there's this idea of re-inhabiting, which means relearning how to be in a place and uh, relating ourselves to all the aspects of that place. I mean, I can't think of a better introduction to this than reading Ursula Le Guin's Always Coming Home, because she she really integrates in, you know, a, a really wonderful, inspiring, readable way so many concepts of indigenous society, uh, you know, in this future tribal world that she describes in the book, but it's really going back to uh, societies of place and cultures of nature that she learned about uh, from her childhood. Um, so, so, so that's a, a concept that I like <laughs> that has been used in various ways uh, is the concept of splice, which is uh, space and place at the same time, that when we're thinking about it, 
you know, our mentality kind of vacillates between the spatial and the placial. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a kind of war, there's a splace war, you know, because there are forces that are constantly trying to make everything into space, quantifiable, like empty space that you fill up with objects. <laughs> and place, which is constantly making place and finding place, because of course the natural world is always making places. And, um, there's so much to say about that. I was just out on the land uh, yesterday and uh, I, I had not been there. I was, I was gone on a trip, it was been over a month. And just, just to see how the land expresses itself is quite amazing. You know, to see what the creek looks like after a, a month of drought or more than a month of drought. Uh, there's just a lot of aspects of it that, you know, it's, it's I, I've often thought that, um, you know, we, we feel like we're responsible for everything. Even if we know we're not, we have this feeling of responsibility. And um, one of the things that we get from spending time in natural places, to use a in quotation marks phrase, uh, is that we find out we are not responsible for everything. Um, like in that... Um, You know, famous Zen poem, koan, whatever we want to look at it as, uh, sitting quietly, doing nothing, spring comes and the grass grows all by itself. And uh, it's not just the grass, you know, it's much more than the grass, that it's more, it's more than spring. It's all of the things that come like spring and it's all of the things that grow like the grass. And that's really what this planet is about. And our spatialization is a kind of rebellion against that and an attempt to, to make it a different way that it will never be. The grass will win out. Nature bats last, okay, an earth first kind of slogan, but there are other ways of saying it. Uh, so so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention in relation to bioregionalism, I really do think Reclu is a, you know, a precursor or even like a prophet, you know, uh, of, of the development of, of bioregionalism. Um, one of the, 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 the groups that had contributed so much to bioregionalism is Pl Planet Drum Foundation in San Francisco. And, and Peter Berg was... Uh, this really important figure in writing about bioregionalism. And Peter used to do an exercise, which uh, I, uh, I went through with him twice. He, he came to New Orleans, uh, he and Judy Goldhaff, who were the two founders of Planet Drum Foundation, came to New Orleans and did, did a lot of activities here. It was really a wonderful visit. And uh, he has this exercise called where where are you at which is very similar to like the classic new orleans uh uh phrase which is where you, where you at <laughs> but uh which which in a way i mean i think it's amazing because i the, the local dialect like the local like working class dialect is called yat and it comes from the word the words where, where you at and uh it's kind of ironic because it's it's thought of as like you know like the 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 New Orleans, uh, down to earth kind of traditional culture, not highly educated, let's say, but it also is very profound. I mean, in a certain in a certain sense, uh, that could be our koan. You know, where you at? <laughs> That's a great koan. Um, and uh, so, what Peter did in this exercise was to ask people who showed up for the workshop to draw a map of their bioregion. And on the map, you could not put anything that was built by human beings. It would be a map of your bioregion with the natural features. So like in New Orleans, it would be the river, the lake, uh, all the bayous, it would be, uh, we don't have a lot of 
mountains here, but we have what we call ridges, which are old levees of the Mississippi, which where you're actually above sea level if you live here. And uh, I, I, I live on a spur, which is an old, where an old crevasse of the Mississippi River created a kind of peninsula above sea level, which fortunately I live on. Um, and uh, so, so he, he said, well, you know, do all those natural features and then also uh, include animals and plants that are indigenous to, to your bioregion. And you, you can do one thing that is about human beings. Put, I can't remember what it was one, or he might have said you could put a couple of them, but what are the greatest threats to your bioregion? So, you know, you could put, if you think they're a nuclear power plant is a threat, or in Louisiana would be, you know, all up and down the Mississippi River, the uh, petrochemical industry, which has destroyed whole communities. Um, but but you can include, you know, what is sort of getting in the way of the bioregional expression here, uh, expression of itself. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, I We did it here, and we also did it, actually, it was the one time that Peter and I were both at the Institute for Social Ecology, and I went to his workshop that he did there. And at the ISE, there were a lot of uh, like young affluent uh, college students, especially from places like California. So there were, there were a lot of young people who had grown up in suburbia and that's basically what they knew. And it was interesting to see that a lot of them really had trouble not focusing on the human transformation of the bioregion and really looking at the bioregion. Uh, obviously in California, there are a lot of places where 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 the the natural features are are very evident, but there are also large areas where it's hard to know where you're at <laughs> in that sense. Uh, so it's a wonderful learning experience, and 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 in a sense rediscovery of where you are, you know, biologically, ecologically, uh, and in in many other ways. Uh, Reclus, by the way, um, was a walker, among other things. And he and his brother went to secondary school in Germany. And they walked back from school. They walked back from Germany to southwestern France. And uh, on the way, uh, they, they originally were from um, Dordogne, which is a little, it was also in southwestern France, but further up uh, into France. But his family moved to Ortez, which is in the Pyrenees, which had a profound effect on him, the Pyrenees. Had, I was just in the Pyrenees. You know, we, we went to Aragon, which is in the Pyrenees, and we drove through the Pyrenees. Uh, and my, I, my French cousins, the only French relatives I, I, I know about, because of an exchange of letters from the 1850s to the 1880s that were discovered. And I went back and it gave me all these letters and so forth. So I, they're, they're, they're in the Southwest near the Pyrenees. Um, Reclus called the, the Pyrenees the Boulevard of Liberty and in admiration of the Basques who valued their, their freedom and fought for their freedom and also had very uh, like direct democratic communal institutions that they defended. But uh, so, so his family moved to Ortez, um, and uh, which is right in the, like if you go across the Southern border area of France, uh, uh, Po would be the town that some people might've heard of. That's the, the biggest place in that area. Um, but, but, um, you know, you, you go almost, you can go down to the Mediterranean and then go west to the, through the Pyrenees. And uh, when they, when they reach the Mediterranean, you'll think this is weird. Uh, like they jumped up and down and hugged each other. And uh, his brother, Ali, said that Elise bit him on the neck. <laughs> and um, Okay, I mean, he was so excited. I don't know why he did that, but it was just out of oh, becoming overly emotional. And uh, 
it's a weird thing, but it, it just, you know, that, that's how he expressed his excitement. <laughs> but but so, so I, I think I can make the case that Elysee Reclus had a very strong bioregional dimension to his, his being. And uh, he also, I mean, he, in one of, he, he wrote these two books, uh, History of a Mountain and History of a Stream, which are kind of, I mean, they're books that adults can read and get a lot out of, and there's a good scientific basis. But also they were particularly designed so that young people could read them and become inspired about nature. And uh, he, he wrote other things in this mode of nature writing. And it's really quite beautiful. And he, he there's one passage where he writes about um, swimming in, in a river and just kind of being enveloped by it and feeling like he was part of it. And that, so, so that, and, and that's why, you know, and, and much like Spinoza, a lot of people have had trouble figuring out whether Reclus was a pantheist or an atheist or an atheist or a pantheist. You know, the same thing happened with Spinoza, where, you know, he was excommunicated from the synagogue and he was he was widely attacked for being an atheist, but he was also attacked for being a pantheist. But of course, what he was really being attacked for was not being a monotheist. And a lot of atheists are monotheists. <laughs> Um, I just want to come in with some things from the chat. Lewis okay. said, good explanation and understanding, John. Bioregionalism derives from the understanding of ecosystem science. Bioregionalism can also be regressive, patriot patriotic, I guess, patriotism and isolationist. Subsequent takeoffs on Kalenbach's Ecotopia, 1975. Here in Ithaca, Paul Glover, who later founded the now defunct Ithaca Hours, often wrote about place. Kirkpatrick mm -hmm. Sale also wrote about bioregionalism, human scale, New York, Coward McCannon, Shield, okay, again, 1980, Dwellers in the Land, The Bioregional Vision, San Francisco, California, Sierra Club Books, 1985. And he also says Peter Berg and Judith Goldhaft were great and links to planetdrum.org. By the right. way, Pete Seeger did that work with the clear water and on the sloop modeled on the boats used for commercial transport shipping until the early 1900s. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree anything can be used in various ways. Um, the, it's very it's very complicated. I, I never liked the book Ecotopia, by the way. I just uh, we, we don't have to go into that. But um, you know, certainly Kirkpatrick Sale has been associated a lot with bioregionalism and you know, wrote uh, a book about it. And uh, um, I, I I I only met him once, and I, I think uh, a couple of people and I had dinner at his house. It was really wonderful talking to him. I thought he was a great person. Uh, uh, and and uh, I really wish I had been in touch with him more. Um, but but I, there were real problems when he, he got involved in these secessionist movements. And uh, one of the things that really disturbed me is that he seemed to support all of these secessionist movements, which were not bioregional movements in, in many ways, um, because they were based on states, for instance. And um, there's this one movement that I was particularly concerned about, which is like the Southern secessionist movement, <laughs> which has a history, you know. Uh, one of the things that's weird about it, they like to use, they like to use the word Southern. Uh, Southern. Well, nobody's in New Orleans, nobody says Southern. Maybe, you know, in Georgia or somewhere they say it, which shows you how we are totally in different regions. But, you know, I thought if, if the Southern secessionist movement ever succeeded, we would have to have a revolution against them <laughs> because New Orleans could not be part of that. But, but you know, and we're, we're nothing like them. You know, uh, we're a Delta culture with a, you know, very strong, uh, obviously uh, Mediterranean and African background. Uh, 
religiously, you know, it's heavily Catholic, although the, the black population is pretty heavily Protestant, but also there's a big like Creole of color Catholic tradition. I mean, it doesn't sound like, you know, Alabama. Uh, so, so uh, you know, that people can be bioregionalists and then come up with things like that are that are uh, uh, very anti bioregionalist, you know, that would really impose uh, an outside culture on people uh, that that's contrary to all their regional and bioregional history. Um, so, uh, but I, I agree that anything can be done with these traditions. And, uh, you know, in general, the, the, the right wing, like in Germany, the, 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 the Greens, when they developed, uh, you know, they started uh, really developing in, in the early 80s, were kind of afraid to use concepts like, you know, Lant, because of the, you know, fascist uh, background of appealing to our land. Um, which I think is a mistake. And as I, you know, I think we've probably talked about in this group, um, you know, one thing I admire about Gustav Landauer is that he tried to take back concepts like Lant and Folk and Geist from the right. And uh, I think we need those concepts. You know, we have to, uh, and of course, we have good grounds on which to uh, to fight against anybody who thinks that the land can be uh, looked at in a proprietary way as somebody's land, although there's an ambigu ambiguity there too. When you have people who never, I mean, you know, traditionally, indigenous people didn't say, this is my land, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but there is a sense in saying this is my land that is actually a good way of looking at it, because in a way you're saying this is where I am, this is where I live, this is what has created me. Uh, I'm part of it. Uh, so we have to think very carefully about those things. But I, we, I think there always are liberatory ways of talking about region, place, land, soil, soil, you know, blood and soil, you know, is a, is a very ominous concept, Blut und Boden in German, but, um, you know, the soil is alive. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, this is sort of like space versus place. There's always a fight over concepts. There's always a struggle over concepts, over the imaginary, really, because all of these concepts are imaginary concepts, which are related to the real, obviously. Yes. So I, I just want to get on um, tape before we finish, David, um, and then you can speak. Just that I think it's because there's four eclipses every year that he's done that 13,000 years. Okay, David, go ahead. But that wouldn't make it 13,000 years. Why? I, because it's... that it, It's four years in a year because there's four eclipses, but I can't imagine that he was actually thinking that a year was defined by eclipse to eclipse. That's that's a little yeah but that brings us if he started at 3000 bce yeah but but then to have four years in one year is i can't imagine that's what he was expecting that's that i mean it's conceivable that that's what he was saying that we should count a year as every the, eclipse the time between eclipses yeah but that's so random with respect to nature it, would, it wouldn't really it, it wouldn't sit with our, you see, the lives. problem is that uh, do we really have good grounds to question the idea that a year is one, you know, rotation uh, around the sun or one revolution around the sun? I, I don't see why that would not be a good thing to preserve the idea that we have four seasons, that we right. go around the sun every year. We don't have four seasons here. All right. In some places, they we have four seasons because we are the Earth. <laughs> now, right. if we're at the equator, we don't, you know, OK, I agree. We don't have four seasons here either, by the way. Uh, we have four seasons here. We, we have four really. <laughs> in some places, people like to speak of five seasons. I think mean, um, the Gaelic, there was like a, the Celts that didn't. 
there China was a, too. There was a uh, like a pre sprinter with like uh, quickening. I, I forget the name. Like before actual spring, when things were just starting to move. But anyway, yeah, I, I appreciated the splice. We talked about splice in the past, and and, and it, it's and yeah, the the complexity of land, and it's like yes, and and here I live on this land. It's like, I mean, Ray Clue talks about it's like the land, you know, flowering in a in a what's the word? How the humans can dialectically work with their land and and. Um, you know, sort of tend it. I, I think of myself as a caretaker of this land here. And mm. there, there's there's a ways to integrate it all, I guess. Um, I might say maybe caregiver would be even caregiver. better. Okay, <laughs> tender. Well, caretaker would be, I mean, you, that kind of would be a subversive concept if we think of a caretaker as someone who gets care. Okay. Care acceptor. Oh, right, right. It's like a mutual thing, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because we're totally cared by for our land. It's, it's, uh, I'm just w wanted to quickly wonder what we're going to do next week. I'm thinking that we've really talked about the one chapter. And anarchism and social transformation is, I mean, they're, every chapter is, is really amazing. And that certainly deserves a, a week. But I, I noticed that Joe was thinking that we were going to do just through chapter four today. Really? Oh, I yeah. thought we were doing three and four today. We were doing three and four. I, I mean, four and five today. That was our okay. plan. That was our okay. plan. But I noticed that Joe sent out an email yesterday saying we're going to do three and four. Oh, and I, I, this morning I sent out a, a correction to that. But well, I have a suggestion. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. My suggestion is we take one more session on the book. Yeah. And cover up, you know, just talk about whatever people want from, from the part, because actually reading all the text would be very repetitious. Right. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, I, I love the texts, and I, I think you could learn a lot from them. Um, we could even mention a few passages from the text. But, but, I don't feel that there's that much interest in going through this book, uh, you know, slowly and taking it because there are only five of us here. And you know, for a long time, we had at least a dozen people every time. So I, I would like to see if we can find things that maybe would draw people back into the discussion. Well, are you in communication with some of the uh, folks who haven't? I, I know that... Um... Well, I feel like we've had a we had a good core for the last few times with yeah. Mary, I know Camille and um and that other woman who lives near New Orleans, they're on breaks. Right. Carrie's, Carrie's with family today. Um well I think we've had like 30 or 40 people participate in this group over a period of time. And I, I you know, I'm sure some of them would be interested in 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 some things we can do that. I, I got an email from somebody who was going to possibly join us today and someone else that he knew, but they they didn't show up. But um, I mean there is interest in discussing things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I'm just wondering if, you know, I, I I think there would be more people here if there were a lot of interest in discussing this. Yeah, it's hard to say. I did. I mean, there's no major force preventing people from being with us, you know? No, no. Uh, there's it's no when people don't have time and then they don't come because they didn't read, you know? So it can be that they're interested, but they people just don't have time so it could happen with anything well that's it's true. a topic where people could turn up and not have read yeah well that would be good I too but, you know for instance when we read the dawn of everything there seemed to be a lot of people participating and reading and maybe people just reading part of it but participating because they were so interested so you know i'm just throwing this out mm -hmm. i'm certainly i love to talk about this you know, I admire Recluse so much, and I think that he has ideas that can really help us. But I also want the group to evolve and, uh, you know, draw more people in and have more points of view. 
I'm happy to, to just what you wrote that we finish that bit next time and then think about another book. Don't read the actual excerpts. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is there something that would really arouse a lot of interest and not something that would just be, you know, kind of calculated to, you know, what are people, I mean, what would people really want to do? Yeah. You're asking the wrong people because we yeah, we're right. here. No one's gonna hear it. But I'm I'm wondering about there we were thinking of the one um there was some talk about the Zapatista book, the Mm -hmm. about the, the Hydra, the capitalist Hydra, that book. But I see from PM Press, I haven't looked at it close, there's a new book of, uh, from, about, from the Zapatistas, from, uh, it's like stories by uh, Galliano. I, 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 I mean, I just got, I get an email, I got an email from them about it. I didn't actually look at it. Well, maybe we could uh, maybe we could take a poll again. I think we've asked people for suggestions and see, see what would get people really interested. What what have they been wanting to talk about? Presumably, you yeah. know, I think we need maybe we need to do more outreach. Also, I, I don't, you know, we haven't been extremely well organized. You know uh -oh. that in, in, uh, you know to to. Uh, I mean, sometimes uh, no mailings have even gone out until the last minute about what we're doing. Well, it's a it's an open email list on Sundays, so it doesn't have to be Joe that that sends it out to remind people. Right. Well, I've been trying to put it. Uh, you know, Facebook. I put it on uh, my two personal uh, Facebook pages. It's Latere Institute, APE, Dialectical Social Ecology, North American Anarchist Studies Network. So I, I've done like six, usually. I was on a trip for three weeks and, you know, a lot of things have kind of, I, I haven't done it perfectly every time, but most weeks I've, you know, I've tried to put it in six different places, but I'm sure other people have a lot of other connections. Is it, is it updated on the um, website? I don't know. To say what the book is. I don't know. I, I can't, who I can't the website. website. Which I'm sorry. Let's hear our website. Yeah, I don't. I can't do anything with that. I don't know how to do it. Charles, uh, who Charles. is the mom, the other group, um, Imboden, he okay. he does it. So I'm I'm okay. kind of at the mercy of him. He's told me he's going to try to set it up so that I can do more, but I kind of welcome other people doing of course, things yeah. too. <laughs> to be collected yeah i'll send out an email to this sunday list today telling them what we're doing and asking what they want to do would... and those of us we won't we won't say what we want we'll make sure it's coming right. from other people and um and then Unless i'll ask charles about the website mm -hmm. yeah i would just put out that i would support doing at least two more weeks on this book since we've only gotten, we we still have the uh, the next chapter that we're going to cover today. We never really talked okay. about. Okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, there are some of these texts that, particularly, this is uh, anarchist political ecology. We could look at his essay, Anarchy, um, right. and you know, see how he defines it and 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 explains it. Um, I think personally, I want to read through the next chapter, the critique of domination chapter, and definitely get to that tomorrow. Good. And that's that's a that's a big one, and that's. And, yeah. I, and I also had stuff about the, the social transformation chapter that I think definitely bears some okay. stuff. All right. You know, I mean, chapter seven or section seven is not, you know, it's very brief. So yeah, it, it, yeah. the critique of domination is really the major uh, concluding part of that section of the book. So what have we decided for next Sunday? Well, are we tending towards um, chapters five and six? 
Well, why don't you throw in seven? It's only seven, like three throw pages. In seven too, because that's only four pages. Four, okay. So, all right. And then what after that? Well, after that, we'll see how far we got. Okay. Actually, seven is only two pages. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. How do we handle that? We should have, we have a week on that one. We can really get into it. Never know. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All. Thank you all take good care.